So today we're talking about co-creating with the divine. And as I thought about this, I thought about the creation story as seen in the Bible. This will be the Jewish Bible. And it begins this way. In the beginning, when God created the world, the universe was in chaos. The waters were all over the place. And there was darkness. Darkness pervaded all before light came. And it tells us that a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And as Rosicrucians, we know that when we hear something like that, something about the wind of God, it is really the breath of God, the very essence of God moving in over the universe. Then he goes on to say, and then there was a command. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And this light is really the representation of God. The, we, as Rosicrucians, we think of it as the greater light, the very essence of God. It goes on to tell us that over the next five days, the divine created the world as we know it, except for two kinds of beings. On the sixth day, then the divine created land animals. And then it said, let us make humankind in our image and after our likeness. And then it says that the divine created humankind, male and female, he created them. Now, in the first chapter, in the second Genesis, we are told that the divine breathed into her nostril the breath of life, and she became a living soul. Now, let's look at the word in the image and likeness of God. Is it referring to our image when we look in the mirror? Of course not. It is referring to having un humankind be given the divine qualities of God, the creative powers of God. And we look, and when we look at the idea of the living soul, that soul that is incarnated into the human being is a soul that is directly connected with universal soul. So let's look at the creation process. How did the divine create? Thought, divine thought, divine vision, understanding that everything that is brought forth into manifestation was created first in mind as a thought. Action, animation, the breath of the essence of God going forward, coming into contact with the unified field, pregnant with all possibilities. Word, the command, God created by fiat, let there be. And when that word went out, the, the manifestation was made. And let's take a moment to look at our Rosicrucian ontology. We won't look at all of the principles, we will look at a number of them. The first one, the most important one, the divine is the universal intelligence that thought manifested and animated all creation. And for us Rosicrucians, we would say the God of our heart, the God of our realization. Why? Because each of us may have a different conception of what God is according to our own level. But the divine has been called the grand architect of the universe, divine mind, creator, God, Allah. Whatever you want to call it, it is divine intelligence. And we're going to see the eyes of Horus. 
to eject. For us Rosicrucian, this is a very important symbol. It is a very ancient Egyptian symbol. And what it represents is this, the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence of the divine. Omnipresence equally present everywhere. There is no place, there is no thing where the divine is not. Omnipotence, all power. Omniscience, all knowledge. And this is universal intelligence that is equally present everywhere and that establishes order in all. All creation is permeated by a universal soul that evolves toward the perfection of its own nature. Think about that. We call this vibratory energy spirit. Matter owes its existence to a vibratory energy which extends throughout the universe and permeates every atom. Everything in the material world vibrates, including us, including thoughts. What makes one item different than another is the rate at which it vibrates. Thoughts are vibratory impulses of the human mind. Man is dual in nature and triple in manifestation. So humankind is both a physical being and a spiritual being having a living soul. It also has a body, a mind, and a soul. And as we have stated before, the soul is an attribute of universal soul, containing all of the attributes of universal soul, just like a drop of ocean water contains all that is in the ocean. The soul incarnates in the infant's body at the moment it takes its first breath, making it a living and conscious being. And as we remember in the creation story in the Bible, it does say that the divine breathed into his nostril, the breath of air. And we know that it is, that happens at the moment of the child's birth. The destiny of every person is determined by the manner in which they exercise their free will and by the karma which results from the choices that they make. Now, humankind from the beginning was given the ability to properly judge, to reason, to decide, and the power to make choices. Therefore, each one of us is responsible for the result of our actions or non-action. Who are we, we might ask? I am going to ask all of us, let's just take a moment, close your eyes and go within and ask yourself, who do you think you are? Do you know it for real? Now, Leah talked a little bit earlier about knowing thyself. This is an adage that we Rosicrucians are well aware of. It is an adage that was written at the entrance to the temple of Apollo in Delphi, Greece. And what is it really saying to us? It is saying to us that we must know ourselves. We must know who and what we can do. We must know who the source is. We must know what action drives us. And it is, no, it is said that to know ourselves is to know God and to acknowledge our divinity and that of others. And as we do that, then we put, we put ourselves in harmony with all 
that is. And then the question becomes this, do we believe that we can create as God did? And so let us now look at some, what some others have said about who we are. H. Emily Cady, one of the first woman doctors in the US and the Christian metaphysician writer said in her seminal book, Lessons in Truth, we suffer because we have forgotten who we are and whose we are. And Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who was a French Jesuit priest, who was not at all appreciated by uh, his community of faith, said this, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Ponder that for a second. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. H. Spencer Lewis said this. He said, man, and of course, men and women, humankind, is essentially a counterpart of God, created in God's spiritual and divine likeness. God gave unto men the directive, the creative power to a degree that God possessed. If we accept his treatment, his statement as true, and it is, what are the prerequisites that will enable us to co-create with God? On understanding and working in harmony with natural and universal laws, the first of which is the law of thought. Many of us knew, know, loved, love Dr. Lonnie Edwards, and we are familiar with his book, Spiritual Laws, that govern humanity and the universe. And he says this about the law of thought. It is the most fundamental for it connects with other laws and influences all of human activities and experiences. This law functions through universal mind, which flows in through and about everyone. It is a creative, intelligent power. Whenever we use our mind, we are setting into motion the creative power and energy of universal mind. Our teachings tell us that thoughts are expression of cosmic consciousness that resides within us. And we say further that a thought is the result of the interaction of the vibrations of spirit and the vibrations of the soul that are within us. And so you're seeing that everything, and Leo talked about that, and the Grand Master talked about that, everything is within us in potential, waiting for us to bring them into manifestation. So having said all this, I'm sure we all agree and we all understand, and we may not like it as Leo has put it, but we create our lives by our thoughts and we are creating all the time. Such creation may be conscious or unconscious. We must ever be mindful of the law of karma and of our conscious and unconscious intentions. When we have a thought, the question that we must ask ourselves is this, from what space is the thought coming from? Is it coming from a space of love, of compassion, of understanding? Or is it coming from a space of anger, rage, or spite? We've already said that we're endowed with free will. And the choices we make about the thoughts we entertain have karmic consequences. 
And so if we're coming from a space of love and compassion, whatever we create, will the thought will bring forth something good. If we're thinking from a space of anger, then we will have an experience that is angry. This is the law. It's just as if we were to plant an apple. Well, we will have an apple tree that will yield apples. It will not yield oranges. Many years ago, and this, got, this has to be 20, 25 years ago, um, we had a bumper sticker that the order has, and this is a, an image of it. Thoughts have wings. I'm sure you've heard that expression. And sometimes people will say thoughts are things. Why? Because thoughts reproduce after themselves. Now, we're not talking about a passing thought, but we're talking about the kind of thought that we entertain in mind, that we give life to, that we fill with vibrations. The thoughts turning into thought forms will go out and bring forth that which is like them. We talked a little bit about the law of karma the law of cause and action. Every single action has a reaction. The universe is one that is orderly. It will not stay out of a balance. It will always strive to be in balance. Karma is neither positive nor negative. Again, it is a balancing act. It is as if you've got a scale. And if the scale is one part goes down a little bit, there has to be an adjustment. It's got to come back and it's got to be balanced. This image I found many, many years ago, and it just speaks to my heart because it says, stand God at the door of your mind. And I know when we, in our Rose Christian studies, uh, we always look at spending time with things that are constructive. The mind, one often says, is like a garden. What do you allow to grow in it? Do you make sure that it is properly, that the soil is properly uh, maintained, giving the nutrients that it needs? the water that it needs. It is the same thing with our mind. What do we allow to stay? What do we entertain in mind? Whatever is in our mind, whatever we focus in is what we bring into our lives. If we entertain negative thoughts all the time, we have, the universe has no choice but to bring us negative results. If we entertain positive thoughts, then our experiences will be positive. So we have to be very, very careful about what we are creating by the thoughts that we entertain in mind. Stand God at the door of your mind. The eternal quest from time immemorial, humankind, you and I, we've wondered about the meaning of life, the purpose of life. And there is always a soul impulse ever pushing us to grow, to evolve, to be that which we were meant to be, to do that which we were here to do to fulfill divine will, to be of service. And sometimes we're not paying attention and we go on and the impulse feels like a dissatisfaction. And what do we do? We pursue material possession. 
We want to get a house, a car, maybe a particular relationship, but it still leaves us dissatisfied. It leaves us unfulfilled because the pursuit of material possessions will not fulfill, will not satisfy the urges of the soul. And so if we were here today, I know that all of us, all of us are on a spiritual path, on a mystical path to grow and evolve spiritually. And although we may have begun it, sometimes life happens and we may stop or we may not do, we may not do as much as we can do. So let's look at what is necessary for us to have a transformational journey toward a fulfilled life. And a fulfilled life is really a life of contentment, a life where we are satisfied with what is. It may not necessarily be what we want, but it is, but we have accepted the present and we can always work toward a better future today. And so where do we begin? with a burning desire, a vision, a passion for something. So what are the steps toward creating a fulfilled life? Many years ago, I found this definition for commitment. So commitment is one. And this is what William Hutchinson Murray said, and he's, and he's from his book, The Scottish Himalayan Expedition in 1951. And this is what he said. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. And this is the truth, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. And we will say cosmic, the cosmic, cosmic mind moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. And he goes on to say, I have learned a deep respect for one of Gert's couplets, and it goes this way, whatever you can do, a dream you can't, begin it. And I would say, Fridays and Soars, dear friends, begin it now. Boldness has a genius, power, and magic in it. And I, it reminds me of the scriptures that say, the divine did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of boldness and courage. Be bold and be creative as you pursue your dream to have a fulfilled life. Some of the steps that are needed, we need to study. Study to acquire knowledge regarding natural laws and divine laws and how they operate in this world and put into practice what is learned. Knowledge is meaningless unless we put it in practice. And we go a step further. We just don't put it in practice, but we live them. The Rosicrucian Order, through its teachings, has provided knowledge from ancient time, has provided us tools that will help us to live in harmony with ourselves, with others, and with all that exist. Meditation. Meditation is a spiritual practice that enables us to go beyond our physical sense, to commune 
with the master within. The master within is that divine part of us that is connected to divine mind, to universal mind. And as we meditate and we attune with the cosmic, we are able to access divine wisdom where guidance, inspiration, instruction, and whatever else we might need is obtained. Now, throughout history, we have seen the genius of mankind. They have invented and created thousands and thousands of things that have never existed before, that we have never seen before. And they've been inspired. They've been inspired by divine intelligence. An honest self-assessment and willingness to be transformed at death. Yes, we have a human body with an ego. And we're not always listening to the whispering of the inner self. Many times we're listening to the ego. And sometimes we know better and it's okay. But when we honestly assess ourselves, then we can see where changes are needed. And if we are committed and we are willing to make those changes, then yes, it is time to make them. And do that in a gentle way. We don't focus on our weaknesses, but we focus on our strengths. And when we look at those weaknesses, we look at the opposite of the weakness. For example, if we are impatient oftentimes, then when opportunities arise, watch ourselves. Again, watch, be a God, and watch what's going on in your mind. Then say to yourself, let me be patient. Let me be patient and practice your patience. This is how we can transform ourselves. And that goes for everything. We must understand and accept the limitations of the outer self and bring the ego under the control of the inner self. The inner self knows exactly what is proper for us, what is for our highest good. And it always, always will guide you properly in the right direction. Imagination, an attribute of God, a spiritual faculty. It is the formative power of thought, the molding power of the mind. It is the ability to create in our minds something that has never existed before. We must use imagination to create the images that correspond to our desire. Imagination is unlimited. Mental creation or visualized visualization. It is a process by which we create in our minds that which we have imagined. And the steps are as follow. Choose a desire that is in harmony with the good something that will benefit you and others. Reflect on your desire and determine if you're worthy of it. You must take the necessary action to fulfill your desire. God helps those who help themselves. Then close your eyes, go within, and mentally see your desire taking shape. Put yourself in the picture. See yourself engaged in the activity. Engage all your senses. What does it look like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Know, know that your dream is taking shape and form in the cosmic world. Know this for certain. Know that it is coming to you. Know that, feel it. Experience the feeling you would feel when it comes. For example, if you took an exam, and it's an exam that would allow you to work in your profession, and you're about to take it, or you've taken it, you want to visualize yourself taking the exam, being able to be knowledgeable, taking the exam, and being able to go into the computer if it is online, and look for the result and see your name there. 
and feel the feeling that you would feel when in fact it happens. Then slowly release the picture, release it to cosmic mind. Cosmic law is being fulfilled. And you end your visualization with the following invocation. If it pleases the cosmic, it is done. Certainly you can repeat this visualization at a later date. This film made in 1900. I'm going to show you that. The first flight of this primitive biplane making aviation history. As this film made in 1903 recalls the first flight of this primitive biplane making aviation history. As the two brothers prepare to attempt the first catapulted takeoff, man's age old dream of flight becomes a reality. Born the son of American slaves and raised in the humbling conditions of poverty and prejudice, George Washington Carver overcame the barriers of his childhood to achieve world renown as a distinguished scientist, poet, painter, and teacher. From an early age, Carver pursued an interest in plants, an interest that led him to Iowa State University and a graduate degree in botany. Dr. Lewis H. Pommel, the distinguished scientist for whom Carver worked at Iowa State, called him a brilliant student, the best collector, and the best scientific observer I have ever known. Carver's use of innovative agricultural methods and scientific research to produce everyday consumer products would change forever the nature of farm economics and sustainability. master of our destiny or victim of circumstances. There are individuals, as we've just seen, the Wright brothers and Dr. Carver, who are masters and creators of their destinies, part of their lives, and innocent or despondent victims of fate at other times. The lives of such persons simply prove that men can be master or slave as he chooses. And this is from self-mastery and faith in the cycles of life. And William Ernest Henley told us this, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Friders and sores, I leave you with a question. Are you the master of your fate? You can be. You have all of the faculties, all of the gifts to be able to do exactly what God meant for you to do, to be of service to humanity. Thank you so much for your attention.